Now, Jupiter used to be flat and look like an M&M candy. Now I'm hungry. And it wasn't the only flat pattern in our solar system. Turns out, there are tons of things that can go wrong during a planet's formation, like locking up to the sun or getting whooshed into open space. Let's check it out. The Earth isn't flat, but Jupiter might have been. Instead of being a big round ball, gas giants in our system might have started more like flat pancakes. Jupiter is one of the oldest of our neighbors. It's 4.6 billion years old, just like our Sun. And when it was just a baby planet, it likely formed through a process called disk instability. It all begins with stars. When a star is forming, it doesn't look like a round object. It's more like a big disk of stuff. During this stage, really hot winds made of charged particles blow out. The dust in that disk contains stuff like carbon and iron. Some of them collide and stick together, forming bigger objects. Dust turns into pebbles, pebbles turn into rocks, and rocks bump into each other, getting bigger. Gas in the disks helps all these solid bits stick together. Some break apart, but others stick around, and they're the ones that become the basic pieces of planets. They're called planetesimals. Even gas giants like Jupiter started off as tiny specks of dust, smaller than a human hair. Eventually, they formed their own big ring-shaped disks of gas. They began to spin around our Sun, growing bigger by gathering gas and rocks like snowballs. Gas giants are special. They were born from the colder parts of the disk. In cold areas, molecules are slower, which makes them easier to grab. In these places, water could freeze, and tiny ice pieces stick together and are mixed with dust. These dirty snowballs gather up and then form cores of huge planets, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. In the warmer areas closer to the star, rocky planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars start to form. After the icy giants were born, there wasn't much gas left for these smaller planets. It might take tens of millions of years for these rocky planets to form after the star is born. And our Sun was growing at the same time, sucking up nearby gas and pushing far away stuff even farther out. After billions of years, the disk changed completely, turning into a round star with a bunch of planets, dwarf planets, asteroids, moons, meteoroids, and comets around it. Recently, simulations showed that these protoplanets as these early dust balls are called, don't start off looking like the planets we know. In the case of gas giants like Jupiter, they look more like squashed balls or M&M's candies, not the peanut kind. When the Sun was young, the disk of gas and dust surrounding it cooled down and became unstable. It started breaking into big chunks. These chunks dramatically collapsed together under huge gravity to create Jupiter. It became a round gas giant over time. There are a lot of oddities that can happen during that process of planet formation. Ever wonder why Venus or Uranus spin in the opposite way compared to other planets? Usually, when things form from a spinning disk of gas, they tend to spin in the same direction. For example, if you spin a bunch of balls on a string, they all twirl in the same way. So, theoretically, all planets should spin in the same direction too. But there are a lot of fast-moving objects, like comets and asteroids, in our solar system. When they smash into planets, especially during their early days, this collision might send the planets to spin in the opposite direction. Venus and Uranus probably survived a massive collision. Luckily, they weren't repelled to outer space. The gravity from the Sun and nearby planets pulled them back into place. There are also so-called tidally locked planets. These are celestial bodies that spin in a way where one side always faces their star, while the other side remains in perpetual darkness. So one side is always very hot, while the other is extremely cold. Hmm. If we were on a planet like that, we would only be able to live on a thin line in between. These planets form when they're very close to their star. The gravitational forces are extremely strong, and over time, these forces slow down the planet's rotation until it matches the time it takes to orbit the star. Imagine you're spinning in your chair. Someone comes up to you and, holding onto your chair with their hands, starts spinning with you. This way, you'll always face each other. 
tidally locked planets kind of work like that. Our moon is tidally locked to our Earth, which is why we only see one side of it. We've discovered more than 5,000 planets outside of our solar system called exoplanets. Some of them have very strange orbits. For example, planets with incredibly long orbits, thousands of years to make one trip around the star, or very wonky, comet-like orbits, or so-called hot Jupiters. They're super close to their star, way closer than Mercury is to our Sun. But these planets couldn't have formed where they are now. As their solar system evolved, they changed their positions for some reason. This rearranging is called planetary migration. There are three main ways this migration happens. First, because of the gas and dust spinning around the planet. When a planet is bumping into this stuff, it can create spiral patterns in the gas. These patterns can either push the planet closer to the center or farther away, depending on how they mix together. It's called a gas-driven migration. This is what Jupiter experienced when it moved closer to the Sun billions of years ago. I wasn't around then. This also explains the existence of hot Jupiters. Second, big planets can shove the smaller ones, changing their paths. Third, the star's gravity can tug on the planet, making its orbit more circular. Ever heard of rogue planets? Imagine a lonely planet floating in the vastness of space without a star to call home. They're like the wandering nomads of our galaxy, doomed to drift around forever. And there are so many of them, there might be more free-floating planets than ones that are tied to stars. We're talking trillions of rogue planets hanging out in our Milky Way galaxy alone. They're often as massive as our biggest planet, Jupiter. But most of them might be Earth-sized. Some might even have thick atmospheres that keep them warm, even though they're far from any star. Some of them might have wild auroras, while others could host moons with liquid water, a potential haven for life. There's even a chance that they might contain extraterrestrial life. These planets might bump into other stars or even entire planetary systems as they journey through space. Sometimes they might get caught in a star's gravity for a while before getting flung back out into space. But how are they born? Sometimes, during this chaotic process of planet formation, not all planets can manage to stay close to their parent stars. Some of them get kicked out of their solar systems due to powerful gravitational interactions with other planets or passing stars. These ejected planets become rogue planets. In 2012, astronomers found a solar system from the very beginning of the universe. This system included a star and two planets. We called it a fossil system. The star is super old, about 13 billion years, almost as old as our entire universe. It was mostly made of just hydrogen and helium. This is unusual because planets usually form from clouds of gas that contain heavier stuff. That's when we figured out that the way planets formed before was different from how they form now. We know that stars with more metals are more likely to have planets. In astronomy lingo, metals means any chemical element other than hydrogen and helium. But in the early universe, there weren't many metals. Most of them were created inside stars and then spread out into space when those stars blew up. So when did the very first planets form? This newly discovered system helps answer these questions. Its two giant planets are orbiting a star that's incredibly low in metals and extremely old. This should be really rare, if not impossible, but they exist. This means that maybe there are more planets in metal-poor systems than we thought. Studying them will help us learn more about the history of planet formation. Picture a tiger. Tigers are known for their beautiful stripes, which they always keep the same. However, imagine if the tiger's stripes could change their size, position, and colors from time to time. Magical, right? But that's exactly what happens with one titan of our solar system, Jupiter. Why and how? Well, astronomers might just have the answer, so let's see. Jupiter is a huge and fascinating planet. When you're looking at its picture from far away, it's like seeing a beautiful sunrise. Here we have an entire palette, from creamy pale yellows to caramel browns, with even some blue shades. Jupiter is a fascinating place made mostly of hydrogen and helium, just like our sun. 
However, it didn't gather enough stuff during its formation to become a star. Instead, it became a colossal ball of gas that could fit more than 1,300 Earths inside. Jupiter has these interesting patterns of dark and light clouds that go around the planet in alternating bands like giant stripes. These dark stripes are called belts and lighter ones are called zones. Actually, it's not unique in this. Earth and Jupiter both have these cool patterns in their atmospheres. It's just that Earth has a few of them, but Jupiter has a lot more. Why are these belts brown and beige? Those can be explained by the combination of hydrogen, helium, and other trace elements in the planet's atmosphere. It's like mixing different colors of paint to create new shades. These belts create beautiful patterns across the planet's surface. Now, because Jupiter has such a massive atmosphere and a weather system similar to Earth's, it experiences some extraordinary storms. So even though these stripes may look calm and peaceful, they're actually part of a wild weather system. It's like a never-ending storm party happening there. These belts and zones move in opposite directions around the planet. The belts go against Jupiter's rotation, like going against the flow, while the zones go with it, joining the dance. And not only do they move in different directions, but they also exist at different heights in the planet's atmosphere. The belts are like regions where things are rising up, like bubbles in a fizzy drink. So the cloud tops in the belts are higher up in the sky compared to the cloud tops in the zones, which are more like sinking areas. So even though Earth and Jupiter have the similarity, their weather is completely different. It's like comparing apples and oranges. One of the most famous storms on Jupiter is the Great Red Spot. But why is it red? Well, that's a bit of a mystery. Scientists think that the storm sits at a higher altitude than the rest of the atmosphere. This means it gets a stronger dose of sunlight. Imagine standing on a hilltop where the sun shines brighter on you compared to the surroundings. In a similar way, the Great Red Spot gets more radiation from the sun. The storm also contains some special chemicals in its clouds, like ammonia and acetylene. When these chemicals receive that extra radiation, they react in a unique way, giving the storm its distinct red color. It's like a special effect in a cosmic theater. Anyway, the stripes look pretty cool and all, but what's the big mystery around them? Well, you see, one day scientists decided to look at data from deep inside Jupiter, about 30 miles below the surface. And after peeking in Jupiter's secrets, they noticed something strange. When they looked at Jupiter using a special type of light called infrared, the colors of its stripes actually switched around. The light bands that were pale and creamy in normal pictures become dark in the infrared view. The dark bands that were belts before now shined brightly in the infrared. This suggests something interesting. The belts on Jupiter have thinner cloud coverings compared to the zones. It's like the belts are wearing sheer, see-through outfits while the zones have thicker clouds like fluffy jackets. So, what we see as dark bands in normal pictures turn out to be bright in the infrared, hinting that these belts have less cloud stuff blocking the light. But here's the most strange part. Every few years, something changes. It's like the weather on Jupiter goes through a wild roller coaster ride. The colors of the belts can change, and sometimes the whole weather pattern becomes a bit crazy for a while. Scientists have been scratching their heads, trying to figure out why this happens. So they've decided to use a special spacecraft called Juno to investigate this. Since 2016, Juno has been gathering a lot of information about Jupiter, like a spy collecting clues. One of the things Juno has been looking at is Jupiter's magnetic field. Just like Earth, Jupiter has a magnetic field. It's like an invisible bubble that surrounds the planet, extending to space. This magnetic field is really important because it protects the planet and everything on it. It acts like a shield against harmful particles from space, like those coming from the sun. But Jupiter's way bigger than us, so his protective shield is much stronger. Magnetic fields are generated by something called a dynamo, which is like a big swirling conducting fluid inside the planet. This fluid moves around and rotates, kind of like a dance party happening deep within the planet. So, scientists have been looking at the data collected by Juno over the years and noticed something interesting. Jupiter's magnetic field has its own little motions, kind of like when you see waves in the ocean. 
Scientists call these motions torsional oscillations, which is just a fancy way of saying wave-like movements. It's like Jupiter is doing its own magnetic dance. Now let's imagine that Jupiter's insides are like a giant pot of boiling soup. Deep within Jupiter, there are slow currents that carry heat upwards, just like a conveyor belt. This heat eventually reaches the upper part where we see the clouds. But here's where things get interesting. Imagine someone starts stirring the soup really fast with a spoon. Those wavy magnetic movements, the torsional oscillations, act just like that spoon. They create a disturbance that messes up the slow currents. Now this disruption has a big impact on Jupiter's weather. It's like turning up the heat in the kitchen and changing the way the soup cooks. The patterns of rising and sinking in the clouds, which we call upwelling and downwelling, get all mixed up. A whirlwind in the soup. Our clever scientists also noticed something special near Jupiter's equator. They discovered a concentrated spot of magnetism called the Great Blue Spot. And guess what? This spot is slowing down, like it's taking a break from its usual fast movement. This suggests that a new type of wavy motion, a new dance, is about to begin. So to sum it all up, the scientists have come up with a cool idea. These wavy magnetic movements, the torsional oscillations, disrupt the slow currents inside Jupiter, messing up the cloud patterns and causing wild weather. And when the scientists calculated the time it takes for these wave-like motions to happen, they discovered that they match the same time periods when the stripes on Jupiter change. So, in simple terms, the scientists think that these wave-like movements in Jupiter's magnetic field are causing the changes in the stripes on the planet. Pieces of a puzzle are coming together. Scientists are still trying to fully understand why this happens, but it's an exciting step forward in unraveling the mysteries of our vast universe. But there are still some mysteries left to solve. To find more answers, scientists need to keep watching Jupiter closely in the future. By observing how the clouds change, they can check if their theory is correct or if it needs some adjustments. From its massive storms to its colorful belts, Jupiter never fails to amaze us with its cosmic wonders. It may not have ignited as a star, but it shines brightly as a gas giant, captivating us with its size and beauty. So keep your curiosity alive and always reach for the stars. Imagine a still, frozen world. It's ancient, about 4.5 billion years old. It's barely heated by the rays of the sun and covered with a thick layer of ice. This world is smaller than our moon, but a bit larger than Pluto. Its name is Europa, the sixth satellite of Jupiter and one of the biggest moons in the solar system. But the coolest thing about this faraway place, it might host life. Astronomers consider Europa one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, it's going to be challenging for any life-seeking missions to access such a deep environment. On the bright side, scientists already have some evidence that there are way shallower pools that probably lie much closer to the surface of the moon. They might be located even less than one mile under the ice. And there are two great things about this news. First of all, it boosts the odds of life existing on Europa. And secondly, if it's true, it can make it easier for future missions to find these life forms, if there are any. Interestingly, the new discovery about these shallow pools came about by sheer luck. The scientist leading the research, Riley Kohlberg, accidentally saw a presentation of his colleague, a planetary scientist. That scientist showed a picture of double ridges on the surface of Europa, and Kohlberg remembered that he had seen similar ridges on Earth. But while such formations are rare on our planet, they are way more numerous on Europa. The following studies suggested that the ridges on Jupiter's moon might be the result of a specific cycle, similar to that on Earth. In this cycle, liquid water freezes and then thaws inside an ice sheet, which is a rather high-pressure environment. 
This causes the sheet to move upward over and over again, creating a two-peaked structure. Or at least that's what happens on Earth. If the processes on Europa are similar, it can prove the presence of shallow waters on the satellite. Of course, the temperature, pressure, and chemistry are very different on Europa. And scientists don't know yet how the ice behaves there. That's why they can't understand how deep or large the water pockets are, or how long they need to refreeze. But what is more or less clear is that such under-ice environments on Europa are very likely to be protected from Jupiter's harsh radiation battering the satellite's surface, which, in turn, increases the chances of life existing on Europa. Now, can we get back to the fact that the ocean on Europa seems to be salty? Red streaks on the satellite's surface might have this color due to their chemical content. They're likely a frozen mixture of water and salts. This is quite unusual because such a composition doesn't match any known substance here on Earth. As for yellow spots on Europa's surface, those might be caused by the presence of sodium chloride. You know this substance as good old table salt. Scientists tried to recreate the conditions on Europa in a lab. They discovered that by combining water, table salt, freezing temperatures, and high pressure, they could get a new kind of solid crystal. This substance might exist both at the bottom of Europa's ocean and on the moon's surface. But besides this information, researchers are in the dark. Hopefully, we'll find the answers to some of these questions around 2030. That's when a mission called Europa Clipper, which is going to be launched by NASA, will probably reach Europa. The mission is going to have several close flybys and figure out if any form of life can exist on the moon. The European Space Agency's JUICE, which stands for the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is going to visit Europa in the next couple of years too. But Europa isn't the only place in the solar system that might host or once hosted life. In 2003, Mars Express, a spacecraft launched by the European Space Agency, discovered methane in the atmosphere of Mars. On our planet, the biggest part of this gas in the atmosphere is produced by living creatures, for example by cattle digesting food. However, scientists think that methane was stable in the Martian atmosphere for about 300 years. And then, in 2006, the methane almost entirely vanished from the Red Planet, and it happened 600 times faster than researchers' models accounted for. The question, what or who generated the gas, and where did it go? Another Martian mystery is microbes that may be sleeping beneath the surface of Mars. There they might have been protected from the harsh radiation coming from space for millions of years. Scientists simulated the conditions on Mars in a lab to check if it could possibly be true. And they were amazed to find out that bacteria could easily survive in such conditions for 280 million years. Which means that if life existed on Mars, we could find the evidence in the planet's subsurface by drilling into the Martian soil. Right now, there is no flowing water on Mars, and cells or spores would simply dry out. Plus, the surface temperature is similar to that of dry ice. In other words, the surface of the planet is deeply frozen. And still, there could be six types of bacteria and fungi living underground on the red planet. The most likely of them is nicknamed Conan the Bacterium due to its tough nature. Well, I guess time will show. Now let's move to Venus. In 2020, Scientists announced that in the toxic Venusian atmosphere, there was something that might mean the existence of life. Unfortunately, scientists didn't have any evidence since there was no chance to collect any microbe specimens or snap any pictures of extraterrestrial life. But they claimed that they had discovered a chemical called phosphine there, and it was a big deal. If it wasn't some previously unknown chemistry that was producing this gas, then there could be some kind of microbial life involved in the process. Phosphine is made up of three atoms of hydrogen and one atom of phosphorus. This gas is toxic to any terrestrial life form that needs oxygen, including us humans. On our planet, phosphine can be found in places with no or little oxygen, for example, marshes and swamps. The gas is created by complex mixtures of bacteria living there. It can also be produced industrially, Come to think of it, phosphine isn't supposed to be in Venus's atmosphere altogether. This gas needs precise pressure and temperature and tons of hydrogen to form. 
it wouldn't be all that surprising to find it on Saturn or Jupiter or famous gas giants. But on Venus? Totally unexpected. There's no way phosphine can be naturally produced on this planet. Tiny amounts of it can be created during volcanic eruptions, lightning storms, minerals blown up to the surface, or meteorites entering Venus's atmosphere, but not as much as astronomers thought they had observed. And it had to make scientists suspicious, but they were too happy about their discovery. They probably thought it meant there could be life on Venus. But even if this gas was created by some mysterious organisms, it would be a big question how they survived on Venus. On our planet, some microbes can thrive in environments with an acidity of 5%, but no more. On Venus, though, clouds are almost entirely made of acid, containing more than 90% of sulfuric acid. The Venusian atmosphere is also 50 times as dry as the driest place on our home planet. And indeed, in 2022, thanks to better and more high-resolution telescopes, it was concluded that there was no phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. Or even if there was, it was a very small amount. So far, we need to look for signs of life further away from Earth. It's been more than a year since the James Webb Telescope, which had taken over 20 years to complete, was launched. And for such a relatively short time, the ultra-modern and most powerful in history piece of equipment has already made plenty of discoveries. By observing the universe at infrared wavelength, James Webb lets us see things no other telescope has ever shown before. The primary goal of this incredible piece of equipment is to study the formation of galaxies and stars that appeared in the early universe. For example, look at the closest to us stellar nursery, a region of space where new stars get born. NASA has shared an image from James Webb that shows a small star-forming region. If you look at the picture attentively, you'll see jets bursting from infant stars. Around them, different colored clouds of cosmic dust are colliding with one another. The view is mesmerizing. The red dust consists of molecular hydrogen. You can also notice that some stars have something like shadows. Those hint at the creation of what will later become planets. At first sight, the image may seem chaotic, but astronomers claim that it's a relatively small and quiet stellar nursery in comparison to some others. Many young stars there are similar in size to our sun, or a bit smaller. The photo itself was taken with the help of Webb's near-infrared camera, NIRCAM. It's the observatory's primary camera that snaps images of the cosmos in two different infrared ranges. Another amazing discovery the Webb telescope has made is smoke molecules in a distant galaxy. It's the first time such molecules have been discovered so far away from our planet. The galaxy in question lies 12.3 billion light years away from Earth. It most likely formed about one and a half billion years after the Big Bang. Despite such a huge distance between the galaxy and our planet, scientists have managed to detect chemical compounds found in soot or smoke, and it's quite a big deal since it has pushed the record for detecting similar complex molecules back by around a billion years. This study has also confirmed the sheer power of the coolest piece of space equipment of all time. It managed to make this discovery despite the fact that the spectrometer needed for the measurements didn't perform to the fullest after having experienced a sudden and surprising degradation. The James Webb Telescope has also helped to boost our understanding of exoplanets. Those are planets orbiting stars other than our own sun. At the beginning of 2023, the observatory spotted its first exoplanet, LHS 475b. It's located 41 light years away from Earth and is approximately the same size as our planet. According to NASA, nowadays, James Webb is the only operating telescope capable of categorizing the atmosphere of Earth-sized exoplanets. The research team behind the discovery believes such results underline the precision of the telescope. They hope that it will help us locate many more rocky exoplanets that we might be able to colonize in the future. Even though, at first sight, it may seem that the universe is pretty empty, it's actually a very busy place. And Webb has all the necessary instruments to see all kinds of cosmic events happening out there. Just look at this image of WR-124. It's a star on the cusp of its explosive demise. In the image, the star is about to go supernova. 
It happens when a star runs out of its fuel and explodes at the end of its life cycle, releasing a giant cloud of space dust and hot gas into space. The star captured by the Webb telescope was at the wolf ray at stage of its life. That's a period when a star is shedding its outer layers before going supernova. The next amazing thing discovered by James Webb is a star-planet hybrid with very strange clouds. This bizarre world, VHS 1256b, is actually a brown dwarf. Those are bigger than planets but too small to classify as stars. They emit some light of their own and are quite hot. But their mass is simply not enough to fuse hydrogen into helium like full-fledged stars do. Space bodies of this kind aren't actually brown. They occur in a wide variety of colors, but those are mostly invisible to the human eye. What we can see is the light they emit, and to us, it appears to be dark orange or magenta. The brown dwarf discovered by the Webb telescope is almost 20 times the size of Jupiter. It orbits two red dwarf stars, and to complete one orbit, it needs over 10,000 years. Astronomers first found out about this unusual exoplanet in 2016, but at that time, they didn't classify it as a brown dwarf and, thus, couldn't explain its puzzling reddish glow. Now, thanks to the James Webb Telescope, they know the space object's origin. Anyway, back to those clouds. As you know, clouds on Earth are made of water vapor, but those on the brown dwarf are different. They seem to be made of... sand. It looks like good old sand from Earth, but it's actually not. The clouds are made of tiny particles of silicate. Another recent discovery involves several large galaxies that scientists believe were born not long after the Big Bang. They aren't supposed to be there, and no one expected to find them. But the James Webb Space Telescope has spotted them. These galaxies, as massive as our home Milky Way, are full of mature red stars. Astronomers have analyzed the light coming from them and estimated their age five to 700 million years after the Big Bang. It means that they came into being when our universe was very young, almost a baby. But the most bizarre thing about these galaxies is their tremendous size and the age of the stars dwelling there. The data received by the telescope don't coincide with the existing ideas about what the universe looked like and how it evolved in its early years. It also doesn't match the earlier observations made by Hubble. And here, James Webb has captured a distant region of space in unprecedented detail. This section of space is known as Pandora's Cluster. In the image, you can see three massive clusters of galaxies coming together and forming a mega cluster. The combined mass of these clusters acts as a powerful gravitational lens. And thanks to this natural magnification effect, scientists can see other galaxies in the region. Astronomers claim that the most recent image of Pandora's cluster is stronger and deeper than they have ever seen. James Webb has also managed to spot thousands of young stars never seen before in the Tarantula Nebula. This space formation got its nickname because of the appearance of dusty filaments spotted in previous images. It's the biggest star-forming region in the local group, which includes the galaxies nearest to the Milky Way. The Webb Telescope's images have helped to shed light on the composition of the Tarantula Nebula. The telescope has also detected protostars, infant stars in the process of gaining mass. Astronomers expect that these protostars will eventually form and shape the nebula further. Among other discoveries made by the James Webb Telescope, you can see the birth of 50 distant stars. Some of them power protoplanetary disks, which might later form solar systems light years away from our own. Here's one more image from James Webb. You can see a supermassive black hole that has a mass of 9 billion suns. It's so ginormous and ancient that scientists are struggling to explain its existence. Astronomers have also discovered a distant ring of dust, rock, and gas that contains a chemical called methylcation. It's known as a molecular building block of life and it makes most of the organic material on our planet. James Webb helped researchers see powerful sandstorms on a planet 235 trillion miles away. Astronomers were happy to discover this treasure chest of countless tiny sand particles. Now look at this. Do you recognize this image? Those are the so-called pillars of creation. But this new view shows us just how star-speckled that dusty region actually is. 
you can compare the new photo with the one taken by Hubble in 2014. This is astonishing proof of scientific progress. Hey, did you hear about the Filet spacecraft and its wild ride on a comet called 67P back in 2014? It was supposed to have a smooth landing, but things went haywire when parts of the device failed to fire and Filet bounced off the surface like a rubber ball. It was like a scene out of a cartoon. Luckily, Filet managed to send signals back to Earth, confirming it was still working, but no one knew where it ended up. It was a mystery for almost two years, until new images from a nearby probe revealed Filet's awkward position. Lying on its side, with its spider-like legs in the air, wedged in a shadowed crack on 67P. And it gets even better. Filet's data suggested it had made a brief second touchdown that lasted only two minutes, and scientists had no idea where it happened. It was like a game of cosmic hide-and-seek. Yoo-hoo! One planetary scientist from the European Space Agency said that Filet left them with, quote, one final mystery waiting to be solved, end quote. The good news is that scientists were able to uncover Filet's second touchdown site and learn more about the surface of 67P. It turns out that when Filet bashed into the surface, it scraped away a layer of dust and debris about 10 inches deep on the surface of the comet, revealing its icy interior. The ice was so bright that the team could see it even in images taken almost two years after Filet's crash. It was like uncovering a secret treasure hidden deep in the comet's belly. And there's more! The timing of the crash allowed scientists to calculate how soft 67P's interior was. By analyzing data from a magnetometer within Filet, they noticed a significant spike right around the time of the second touchdown. The spike lasted for about 3 seconds, and the team concluded that the comet's interior was about as soft as freshly fallen snow. Imagine that! A comet with fluffier boulders than froth on a cappuccino. Now that planetary scientists have a better understanding of a comet's physical characteristics, they can plan for future missions with much more certainty. And that's where things get exciting. The hope for a future project named Ambition would be to return, for the first time, a cryogenically stored sample from a comet's interior to Earth. Filet Lander may not have had the smoothest landing, but it sure gave us some wild and wacky cosmic adventures. When it comes to comets, probably the star of the show, wink wink, in the comet world is Halley's Comet. As a periodic comet, it visits Earth every 75 years or so, which means that you have a chance to see it twice in your lifetime. The last time it came by was in 1986, and it won't return until 2061. The comet was named after the English astronomer Edmund Halley, who realized that three comets seen in 1531, 1607, and 1682 were the same comet returning again and again. He predicted that the comet would return in 1758, and it was named after him, even though he wasn't alive to see it. Halley's Comet was first seen in 239 BCE, and ancient Asian astronomers – that's a mouthful – recorded its passage in their chronicles. Back then, people believed that comets were omens of great disaster or change. But we know better now. In the 1900s, the writer Mark Twain joked that he came in with Halley's Comet in 1835 and that he expected to go out with it. He passed the day after the comet's closest approach in 1910. Wow! The comet Hale-Bopp also gathered some attention back in 1997. This comet was so bright that people could see it with their naked eye for about a year and a half, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. In fact, it was a thousand times brighter than Halley's Comet. Even folks in heavily lighted areas, like Chicago, could catch a glimpse of its blue and white tails. The Hale-Bopp Comet was discovered by Alan Hale in New Mexico and Thomas Bopp in Arizona. They were just gazing at the sky and suddenly saw this fuzzy object nearby that wasn't there before. Astronomers were excited about this event, too. They used telescopes to study the comet as it approached, and NASA even used the Hubble Space Telescope to get a better peek. Hale-Bopp's nucleus was huge, like 19 to 25 miles across, and there was a lot of dust streaming out from it. Now, speaking of Hale-Bopp, 
The pop song Mmm Bop by the Hanson Brothers was a worldwide hit in that very same year, 1997. Mmm, is there a connection? Anyway, 5,000 years ago, another comet swung by our sun and put on a show for civilizations across Eurasia and North Africa. Unfortunately, this mysterious visitor wasn't recorded in any historical accounts. But scientists have a sneaky way of figuring things out. Enter Comet Atlas, or C2019Y4, which made its debut in 2020. Sadly, Atlas met its end when it broke apart into a shower of icy fragments. But in a new study using NASA's Hubble Space Telescope, astronomers discovered that Atlas was a broken-off piece of that ancient comet from 5,000 years ago. Talk about a family reunion! Comet families are not unusual, and one of the most famous examples is the doomed Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet that fell piece by piece into Jupiter in 1994. But Atlas is a bit of a weirdo. It broke up while it was far from the Sun, which is strange because it should have broken up during its closest pass to the Sun. How did it survive its last pass 5,000 years ago? Well, by observing the breakup of the fragments, scientists can learn more about how the parent comet was put together. And they've discovered that one fragment of Atlas disintegrated in a matter of days, while another piece lasted for weeks. This suggests that part of the nucleus was stronger than the other part. But the explanation for why it broke apart is still up in the air, pun intended. It could be due to centrifugal forces, or it could be because of super-volatile ices that blew the piece apart like a firework. One thing is for sure, though, Atlas's surviving sibling won't return until the 50th century. So until then, we'll have to settle for admiring the other beauties of the night sky. This next funny story is about a bunch of astronomers on the island of Maui. One night, they were just chilling and gazing at the stars with their fancy telescope, when they suddenly spotted something weird. It was a comet, but not just any old comet. This one was traveling super fast and had a really strange shape. It was so odd that they even thought it might be a spacecraft from outside our planet. They named it Oumuamua, which means a messenger from afar arriving first in Hawaiian. Now, I know what you're thinking. Did they find a new civilization living in space? Well, not quite. But what they did find was pretty cool. You see, when comets pass through our solar system, they usually speed up as they leave because of the sun's gravity and the dust on their surface. But Oumuamua was too small to have any surface dust, so it didn't have the same glowing halo as other comets. So what was causing Oumuamua to speed up? One possibility was due to a strange effect, where small bodies like asteroids absorb photons from the sun and re-radiate them in a propulsive plume. But that effect was too small to explain Oumuamua's acceleration. That left three possible explanations. Propulsion provided by nitrogen, carbon monoxide, or molecular hydrogen. And guess what? One theory is that Oumuamua was rich in water, which is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Some believe that before the comet entered our solar system, the water froze into ice in what's known as an amorphous state. This type of ice is porous and dotted with pockets, like my genes. The theory then goes to say that cosmic radiation caused some of the hydrogen in the water molecules to break away, collecting in the pores like fuel in tiny fuel tanks. When Oumuamua entered the inner solar system, it probably warmed up just enough for the ice to convert to its crystalline state, essentially closing the pockets and forcing the hydrogen out of the comet. This might have provided the propulsive push that could explain the acceleration. If this theory is correct, there are no cosmic neighbors, just some really cool science. Aloha! Earth's magnetic field hides a fascinating story. It turns out that it's getting weaker day by day. In fact, it's been doing so for the last 3,000 years. And if this trend continues, we could be in for some trouble within a millennium. What's the big deal? Well, picture this. Magnetic north becomes south, and vice versa. Pretty wild, right? When this happens, our planet's protective magnetic shield might weaken, allowing more cosmic rays to hit us. 
These high energy particles from the universe can cause electronic malfunctions in our satellites and produce elements that could be harmful to us. The last time a polarity reversal occurred was between 772,000 and 774,000 years ago. Thankfully, humanity has some pretty smart people on the case who are investigating the history of Earth's magnetic field. They take cores of sediments from the seafloor and study the magnetization of fossils to figure out when these reversals occurred in the past and when they might happen again. Another group of researchers is studying the South Atlantic Anomaly (SAA), a vast region of Earth's magnetic field that is about three times weaker than the field at the poles. Using data from multiple satellites, they are trying to figure out what's causing the SAA and how it might change in the future. This could give us a glimpse into how a weakened magnetic field can affect our satellites and our planet. Sure, our generation won't be here to witness these changes, but it does make you wonder what that planet might look like upside down. Magnetically, that is. NASA's astronomers have also announced that in 4 billion years, the Milky Way galaxy is going to get a major glow up. After a cosmic collision that will shake things up. I'm not talking about a small fender bender here. I'm talking about a titanic collision with our neighboring Andromeda galaxy. Humanity will have to hold on to its space helmet for this one because the sun might get flung into a new region of the galaxy. However, our Earth and solar system probably won't be seriously affected. Sounds difficult to believe, so how come? NASA's Hubble Space Telescope did some hardcore measurements of Andromeda's motion. Although the galaxies will plow into each other, the stars inside each galaxy are so far apart that they won't collide with other stars during the encounter. However, the stars will be thrown into different orbits around their new galactic centers. According to simulations, our solar system will probably be tossed much farther from the galactic core than it is today. Set your telescopes aside, you don't need to start counting down the years. This event is likely scheduled in about 4 billion years, so chances for us to witness it are zero. Saturn is losing its rings. Thankfully, we won't be here to witness this sad event either. Apparently, the rings are being pulled into Saturn as a dusty rain of ice particles, all under the influence of Saturn's magnetic field. According to NASA's research, the ring rain is draining an amount of water products that could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool from Saturn's rings every half an hour. The entire ring system will likely be gone in 300 million years. Scientists believe we should consider ourselves lucky to witness Saturn's ring system at all, as it seems to be in the middle of its lifetime. But if you think about it that way, that rings around planets are all temporary, there's a chance we've just missed out on the giant ring system of Jupiter, or those of Uranus and Neptune. These planets have only thin ringlets around them these days. Scientists have long debated whether Saturn was formed together with its rings or if the planet acquired them later in life. The new research favors the second scenario, indicating that they are unlikely to be older than 100 million years, while Saturn itself is around 4.5 billion years old. What caused the rings to appear in the first place? Well, there are a few theories. One of them suggests the rings could have formed when small, icy moons in orbit around Saturn collided. Perhaps their own orbits were messed up by a gravitational tug from a passing asteroid or comet. Who knows what humans might end up looking like in the future? It's unlikely we'll see any major changes in our lifetime. But let's take a journey to the future and ponder what we might evolve into. Will we become cyborgs with all sorts of cool machine implants? Or maybe we'll become a hybrid species of biological and artificial beings. To understand our future evolution, we gotta take a peek at our past. A million years ago, Homo sapiens didn't even exist. There were a few other similar species though, like the Neanderthal. Fast forward to today, and humans have become taller and sturdier. 
maybe in the future will become smaller to conserve energy, as it's predicted that our planet will get more crowded. Speaking of crowded planets, living in these new conditions means we have to adapt, and fast. We're constantly interacting with lots of people, and remembering names is becoming a crucial skill. Luckily, technology might help us out with brain implants that will improve our memory. In the future, we might also have more noticeable technologies as part of our appearance. Imagine having an artificial eye with a camera that can read different frequencies of light. While predicting a million years into the future is pure speculation, we can use bioinformatics to make some predictions about the immediate future. Demographic trends suggest that urban areas will become more genetically diverse, while rural areas will become less diverse. And what about space? If we end up colonizing Mars, our bodies could change due to lower gravity. Maybe we'll have longer arms and legs, or even insulating body hair like our Neanderthal cousins. In the future, our moon is also going to witness some dramatic changes. We'll miss these ones too. In about 5 billion years, things are going to get really interesting in this corner of the universe. For now, the sun is chilling in its main sequence phase, just burning hydrogen like nobody's business. In the future, during the red giant phase, the sun is going to puff up like a balloon until its atmosphere reaches out and engulfs our beloved Earth and Moon. Our natural satellite, which is already moving away from Earth, is going to get warped around the sun's influence. Its orbit will get all wonky, and it'll end up closer to Earth during the new moon phase than during the full moon. And that's not even the worst part. If left alone, the moon would keep on moving away from Earth until it'll need almost 50 days to orbit us. As the sun continues with its own journey, its atmosphere will drag on the moon and cause its orbit to decay. Eventually, the moon will get torn apart into a stunning ring of debris circling Earth. We're talking about all its mountains, craters, and even the footprints and flags we left there, all scattered throughout the debris field. There's a chance the sun will shed enough mass to spare Earth and the moon from total annihilation. Or if we're really lucky, the sun will lose 20% of its mass and we'll be safe and sound. It's all just theory right now, we haven't seen a red giant star during this phase. The universe itself might go completely dark one day too. Scientists can't predict it with absolute certainty, but they can make some educated guesses. Right now, our universe is 13.77 billion years old, and it's still churning out new stars left and right. It's said that eventually, after about 1 trillion years, the last star will be born. That final star will be a little guy, a red dwarf, just a fraction the size of our sun. These stars are champs at living long lives, slowly sipping on hydrogen to keep their fusion reactions going. But even they can't last forever. Fast forward about 100 trillion years and the last light will go out. The universe will be dark and lonely, but thankfully we won't be here to watch it all fade away. See this? You're looking at the best full portrait of the sun by far. Thankfully, our 4.5 billion year old parent star didn't use any makeup to fix its skin tone before this photo shoot. And now, we can study its surface in great detail. This iconic image was taken in March 2022. NASA wanted to gain a better understanding of solar behavior and its impact on life on Earth, and the future of our space technologies, of course. To do so, they launched the Solar Dynamics Observatory Satellite, or SDO, mission in February 2010. This legendary photo shoot happened 12 years later, when SDO was halfway between the Earth and the Sun. Scientists had to assemble 25 individual images like a puzzle. So the final image contains 83 million pixels. Yeah, the resolution is about 10 times better than your fancy 4K TV screen. Look at this amazing cookie-like pattern. Typically, the bright surface of the sun overshadows it when we observe the star from Earth. 
Thankfully, NASA explored the light beyond the visible range, which allowed them to discover some invisible details of the sun's face. When you adjust your selfie with filters and effects, you can end up with completely different portraits, highlighting different spots of your face, even those you didn't know existed. Hmm. The same principle works here. All these plasma balls are the same photo of the sun captured at different electromagnetic wavelengths. The revealed spots and patterns can help us understand events happening inside the sun's skin a little better. At the speed of light is supposed to mean super quick. But this rose gold ray caressing your cheek at dawn has come a long way and is incredibly old in human terms. Photons generated by the sun's core take between 10,000 to 170,000 years to travel through the star's atmosphere, and then around 8 minutes more to reach Earth. So let's explore what's taking them so long. Our tour begins with the upper layer of the sun's atmosphere. Remember solar deities in movies and theater plays? They often wear luxurious crowns with golden rays. Well, the real sun does wear a fancy corona too, which is the outer layer of its atmosphere. But of course, its size and glory are incomparable with those plastic costume crowns. And its shape is not so stable. Corona is a gas shell enveloping our parent star, so its size and form constantly fluctuate under the influence of the sun's magnetic field. You can spot this crown with the naked eye from Earth during total solar eclipses. It looks like a beautiful, intense radiation around the solar disk, which itself is completely blocked by the Moon. The corona stretches 5 million miles above the Sun's surface, whereas our blue planet is only about 8,000 miles in diameter. So, one hypothetical ray of the corona equals a row of about 625,000 Earth-sized planets. And suddenly, all my problems begin to seem tiny. Now here's another fun fact. The Sun's corona kind of breaks the laws of known physics because it's hotter than it should be. Its temperature reaches 2 million degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the surface of the Sun is only about 9,000 degrees. Although the word only doesn't fit here, because it's still super warm in human terms. Usually, temperature tends to fall as you move farther from a heat source. But it's not the case here. Space scientists are still scratching their heads trying to investigate this mystery. Thankfully, the recent photo shoot allows us to explore what's going on inside this massive hot stuff without risking losing our sight. Take these beautiful bright spots, for example. They depict solar flares happening under the corona layer. Solar flares are powerful explosions that happen when magnetic fields bump into each other. When it happens, they change shape and quickly reorganize. These fields arise from plasma, which is very turbulent itself, so these events are no surprise for the local weather. Now, who would have thought that the sun has dark spots on its skin, just like people? These darker areas are known as coronal holes. Earthlings can experience their impact when they observe the beautiful aurora lights in the polar regions. Coronal holes look darker because plasma in these spots is cooler, less dense, and magnetically open. These conditions allow the solar winds to escape outward across the solar system rather than hang out at the sun's surface. And when they bump into the Earth's magnetosphere, auroras emerge to fascinate our eyes. Thankfully, the local fields cool down the solar winds. Nobody wants their eyes to melt, right? Now, if we were looking for an analogy to the sun's hairs, the best candidate would be solar prominences. These large, bright plasma loops arise from the sun's surface and stretch for thousands of miles into space. Their lifespan varies from days to several months. It's one of the most common events in this region. Although the first detailed description of solar prominence dates to the 14th century, modern scientists are still researching how and why they're formed. Diving further inwards, we're facing the transition region. The thickness of this layer is about 62 miles, and the local weather is unthinkable. <laughs> Temperatures can rise up to 900,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The transition layer sits between the corona and the last region of the sun's atmosphere, called the chromosphere. Now, speaking of which, welcome to our next stop. The chromosphere region is famous for a scientific mystery called a spicule. Come on, say it with me. Spicule. Yeah, that's fun. These spectacular grassy-like jets of plasma fire upwards from the surface of the sun and reach speeds of approximately 224 miles per second, as if they're jumping on a trampoline from the surface of the sun. 
Each spicule lasts for just a few minutes in outer space before falling back into the solar atmosphere. Astronauts were having a challenging time trying to explain how magnetically charged particles could manage to escape the massive gravity of the Sun while being so close to it. The possible answer emerged in 2017. A group of scientists discovered that neutral particles provided the magnetically charged particles with extra buoyancy to escape the solar gravity for a while. Which is better than my cousin's explanation, which is happy thoughts and pixie dust. Yeah. Now let's go ahead and travel 1,000 miles inward toward the chromosphere to finally reach the solar surface, the photosphere. It's around 248 miles thick. But unlike planet Earth, the Sun's surface is not solid or stable at all. The temperatures here are insanely hot for any matter to exist. On the other hand, scientists often call plasma the fourth state of matter. And why not? It's made of ionized atoms and free electrons, so it kind of deserves to matter. So what's the matter? <laughs> Maybe someday we'll happen to meet the local civilization of plasmoid people. But I think it's best that we skip their welcoming warm hugs. You know, hot, hot, hot. Anyway, the photosphere is our final stop, because humankind doesn't have the technology to explore the sun any deeper. So if you want to learn more, you'll have to invent your own spacecraft. But time's a wasting. You'll only have about 7 to 8 billion years. After that, our sun will fade away, according to scientists' estimates. Actually, those same scientists will be going first. Now you have a serious competitor, though. NASA's Parker Solar Probe is the current champion for the deepest dive into the sun. The spacecraft managed to travel 4.5 million miles from the sun's surface toward its core on September 27, 2023. And then, the Parker probe repeated its own record once again in December of the same year. So, why didn't it melt, I hear you asking? The probe has been designed to withstand insanely intense conditions and temperature fluctuations. It's equipped with a custom heat shield and an autonomous system protecting the mission from the massive solar lights. NASA has further ambitious plans. In December 2024, Parker will make its closest approach to the Sun. It will travel faster than any man-made object has ever traveled, at the speed of 435,000 miles per hour. The probe will be just 3.8 million miles away from the Sun's glowing hot surface. It's like landing on a star. Astronomers have already compared this epic upcoming milestone with the moon landing. I'm thinking, however, it might be safer if we, you know, landed at night. Yeah, you're right, that's an old joke.